Warren Buffett's extremely successful approach to investing is based on the concept of value. Now, you may be forgiven for thinking that value is no longer relevant, given the dynamics of what we can see in the markets at the moment. But I think it's a bit too soon to write off value as being a dead investment style. Now, remember, if you do want to learn more about investing, you can do that via our Patreon membership. You'll see a link to that in the description below me and beside me. So let's look at Warren Buffett's value investing style in a bit more detail. This is not a recommendation. If you want advice tailored to your specific circumstances, seek independent financial advice. So let's start by describing what we mean by value investing. Now, the most important concept is fair value, which you can see below me here. So imagine we have some kind of stock or a fund and we're trying to work out exactly what it's worth. Well, we have to have a model for that. If we don't have a model, we don't know the fair value. The most commonly used type of model is called a discounted cash flow model. And I've done a whole video about that. And if you want a link to that video to learn more, there should be a link at the top of the screen. But as usual, Warren Buffett's got a beautiful analogy which he uses to describe how a discounted cash flow model works. And as you can see from this beautiful picture of a gold crest in a bush, it's based on the old adage that a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And Warren Buffett says that you only need three things which are the inputs to your discounted cash flow model. And in this metaphor, of course, the profit that you get from the company, the dollars, are like birds in the bush. Firstly, how certain are you that they will actually be birds in the bush? Will the company be generating cash flows in the future? If you are convinced that there will be cash flows, the next question is when are they going to occur? Also, how big are they going to be and how likely are you to get them? If the company goes bankrupt, there won't be any more cash flows, for example. And the final question is what is the risk-free interest rate? And that's because a cash flow in the future is worth less than a cash flow today. How much less depends on the risk-free rate of interest. High levels of interest mean that the cash flows are worth less. And of course, at the moment, we're seeing very low interest rates and that's pushed up the value of future cash flows. But of course, the whole reason for the model itself and our assumptions about future cash flows is that we can put a fair price on a company today. How many birds do you pay for those birds in the future? What's the value in dollars today for the cash flows which you'll be generating in the future? You don't want to overpay for those cash flows. So now we've got our fair value, that's the blue line underneath me. But of course, stock prices won't just stick to that fair value because no two people will ever agree on what that fair value will be. Their model assumptions will be different, their models will be different, and some people don't use a model at all. So usually what we'll see is a huge degree of fluctuation around some fair value. Sometimes there'll be exuberance in markets and sometimes there'll be despair in markets. And this is why Warren Buffett comes up with another beautiful metaphor, which is the idea of Mr. Market. And the idea here is that sometimes markets are just irrationally exuberant. They're willing to pay you a huge amount for a company, in fact, more than it's actually worth. And if that's the case and your model says that the value is actually lower, then you'd be happy to sell to Mr. Market at those very high prices. But notice that if there is a consensus about the true value of a company, this stabilizes the price around its fundamental value because when prices are too high, that's when we'd sell a company. And conversely, when markets are in a state of despair, that's when Mr. Market is willing to sell us a company at a very low price. And as a value investor, that's a bargain in terms of our model. But again, notice how that stabilizes the price because we buy when prices are below the fundamental value. So this is an inherently stabilizing approach to investment because if we're above fundamental value, we sell. And if we're below fundamental value, we buy. And if there is any kind of market consensus about the true value of a company, and there usually is, then that will push the value of the company towards that fundamental value, whatever it should be. Now, of course, Warren Buffett is an active investor. His job is to choose stocks which outperform the broad market, in his case, the S&P 500. And he's done that very successfully over a very long period of time. But you don't necessarily have to have an active fund to make money out of value. An index provider like MSCI can automate the whole process. And then it's the job of a passive fund manager to simply track 
that index. And there could be multiple companies which track this index, for example, which is the MSCI World Value Index. So this is a sub-index of MSCI World, which is, remember, only developed markets. And the way MSCI constructs this index is based on three different valuation measures. And then by combining these three valuation measures, it goes overweight the stocks which are relatively cheap based on those three measures. Then over time, as the valuations of the stock change, it'll change the weights. So for example, if a stock is very cheap this year, the index will have a large weight in that stock. But as the price of that stock increases, say, and the weight in the index will go down, and then any funds tracking the index will have less of that stock in them. And if it gets too expensive, the stock will probably drop out of the index altogether. Now, if there are enough of these value indices out there, then you could have an entirely passive market where you still have price discovery. Because one of the criticisms of passive investing was that it would stop price discovery. But as you can see, that simply isn't the case. And the value measures which this MSCI index are using are fairly standard ones. The first one is price to book value. Book value is the liquidation value of a company, which is the amount of money you'd get as a shareholder if the company liquidated all of its assets. And then the value of measure itself is the price of the company, which is how many dollars you pay for it per share, divided by the book value per share. The second measure is a fairly standard one, which I talk about all the time. This is the price compared to the forward earnings. Now, those forward earnings are based on forecasts by analysts, so they are just an educated guess, but they do factor in all available information. And the important thing is that those forward earnings are forward-looking, and equity markets tend to be forward-looking in terms of how they value stocks. So this measure would be the price you'd pay today for the forecast future profits of a company. And if it's expensive, you're paying a lot of dollars for each dollar of profit. And the final valuation measure is based on the price you'd pay today for any dividends which the company has been paying you. So here are the performance statistics from the fact sheet for that index created by MSCI. And in this graph, you can see the returns since December 2005, where MSCI World is the orange line and MSCI World, the value variant, is the blue line. Now, normally what you'd expect to see and hope to see is that the index would outperform the broad market, which is MSCI World. You can see that initially the two are roughly neck and neck until about 2010, but then gradually MSCI World outperforms the value variant as value has underperformed. So for example, if you look at 2020, MSCI World value actually lost a little bit of value, whereas MSCI World went up by almost 17%. So that was a year of huge underperformance. So it seems as if this implementation of value is simply a very poor way of investing. Or is it? Now, at the moment, market news is completely dominated by a style of investing which you might call pump and dump. At least that's what it was called last time around during the dot-com bubble. And many of the headlines at the moment are about this company, which is called GameStop. And you can see its primary business is to sell computer games. For example, here's Mass Effect 3, which was a great game. I really enjoyed it. So here's the kind of story which you'll have heard about GameStop. So the headline here in the FT is GameStop can't stop going up. Now, it turns out that some large hedge funds had actually gone short this stock because they thought its price would fall. Because remember, you can always sell a stock you don't own in order to buy it back later at a lower price. That way, if it does go down, you can monetize a fall in price, just as you can monetize a rise in price by buying the stock. But what happened with GameStop was that many retail investors, so those are normal people like you and I, went onto the Reddit forum Wall Street Bets, and they agreed between them to buy call options, which is a right to buy these stocks at a particular price at a particular time in the future. And by agreeing to buy derivatives, which is a kind of levered position in the stocks, they forced the market makers for those options to buy very large amounts of GameStop stocks. And in market lingo, that's something we'd call a short squeeze. And you can see that the strategy was extremely effective. This is the share price of GameStop going up pretty much vertically. But in this tweet from Coifin, you can see the actual earnings for GameStop. 
And if we zoom in on that graph, you can see the black line here is the profits that the company makes. That's been gradually falling since 2017, and it's actually gone negative since the beginning of 2020. So this is a loss-making company. Now, what you wouldn't expect to see in that case would be a very sharp rise in the value of the stock. But that's exactly what happened because of this retail market activity in the options market. And the result of all that option buying and the hedging by the investment banks who sold the options is that GameStop shot up in terms of its share price. So as of today, and of course the stock is very volatile so you won't see the same price as me, but today that created a market capitalization for the company, which is the number of shares multiplied by the price per share, of just under $22 billion. To place that in some kind of context, if you compare it with a very large company like SIBO Global Markets, which is actually a platform where many of the derivatives are traded, ironically, that has a market capitalization of just 10 billion. Notice that the price to earnings ratio of GameStop is actually not defined because the company's making a loss. Whereas SIBO, oh how boring, is actually generating good earnings per share for its shareholders. And that's on a price to earnings multiple of 21 times. So you can see that in the space of a few months, this is a stock which has gone from small cap to mid cap to large cap. And in fact, it's much larger than some of the companies in the S&P 500. Although a loss making company isn't eligible to be included in the S&P 500. So this kind of activity is certainly fun and it must have been great fun to take part in and also to poke some fun at hedge funds which had gone short the stock who were forced to close out their position. But by no means is this investment. This is speculation. And to understand the difference, there's this great quote from Warren Buffett's 2000 letter to shareholders, where he actually says the line between speculation and investment isn't usually very clear, but it becomes even more blurred when many market participants have enjoyed triumphs. And he says, nothing sedates rationality like large doses of effortless money. However, behind all of these headlines about GameStop and the bubble, there's some new hope for value investors. This top panel is the value of MSCI World since 1973. And the lower panel is the outperformance of MSCI value relative to MSCI World. So when this graph is going upwards, that shows that value is outperforming MSCI World. And when it goes downwards, it's underperforming. Now these two dates which I've marked on are when value's outperformance reaches a peak, and then more recently, when it reaches a trough. And you can see that value did extremely well up to about 2007, just before the global financial crisis. But since then, it's been steadily underperforming, and that underperformance accelerated over 2020. But what you can see since September 2020 is that there's actually been a bit of a turnaround for value versus MSCI world. So the red line above me here is MSCI World Value, and the blue line is MSCI World. And after that turnaround point in November 2020, there has been an outperformance of value. And that's what you can see in this lower panel here. If I construct a pure value index where I remove the effect of MSCI World on MSCI World Value, you can see the pure outperformance due to value. And that seems to be steadily rising. Of course, what we don't know is whether that's going to continue. Is this just going to be a damp squib or is it going to be part of a great big new trend? Now, this also applies to countries. And in fact, if you superimpose the returns on the FTSE 250, the UK mid cap index on this MSCI world value index, they're very similar to each other. And that also applies to the time at which they both perked up. The first date which you can see here is when the US election occurred on November the 3rd, 2020. And the second date on November the 9th was when the first vaccine passed its phase three trials and it was shown to be very effective. So that seems to have been the catalyst which improved many of the stocks which had been lagging up to that point. So perhaps this is just a reaction to that news or it could be part of a bigger trend. Let's hope it's the latter. If we break down the single country returns since that turnaround date of November the 3rd, you can see that emerging markets come out of it very well. So Russian equity, Brazilian equity, Indian equity, but also the UK FTSE 250 have been leading global markets since that inflection point. But the broad US market, the S&P 500, has been lagging behind those others. 
Now Barclays provides valuation measures on country equity markets and in many cases those time series go all the way back to the 1980s but that's certainly not true of all of them. So for example Brazil has got a very short time series as have many other emerging markets. So in order to analyze this what I've done is I look at how often the valuation measure has been lower than its current value. So for example the US has been lower than its current Cape value 92% of the time. So it looks relatively expensive compared to its own CAPE history. And of course CAPE is the cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio which I talk about quite a lot. Whereas by comparison the UK has only been cheaper than its current CAPE about a third of the time since 1980. So on this measure the UK looks fairly cheap. So another way of looking at value investing is by country and it's certainly not the case that all countries are expensive. Some countries actually look quite reasonably priced at the moment and if this value out performance trend continues that could be good news for those markets. So it's quite exciting to see that turnaround in value as an investment style. I think it's far too soon to say whether value is going to be outperforming for a long period of time now but that certainly is encouraging and it's certainly something to watch. And if you do think that trend's going to continue, there are still many pockets of value, so you certainly haven't missed the boat. So if you do want to learn more about investing, there's a very easy way to do that. You can sign up for our free weekly market roundup. There'll be a link in the description below me and above me. And as always, thank you for listening.